Hello, Mr. Tejada. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Alex. Thanks for calling. Um, can you please state your name and um, how old you are? Yes. My name is Roberto Tejada. I'm 54. And I... Of... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if I could have a little bit of background information about you and... Sure. A little more. Yeah. So, um, I was born in Los Angeles, California in 1964. Uh, I grew up there. My parents are both from Colombia, South America, and having grown up in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s, most of their friends in, in Los Angeles were Mexican or Mexican-American, as were my friends mostly, both in grammar school and in high school. So I often tell the story that my um, mother and father often just for shorthand because they would be asked where they were from, and they often knew that most people in Los Angeles and in the United States didn't really know where Colombia was, uh, would often just say that they were Mexican because it was easier and a kind of shorthand. So I often say that my parents often passed as Mexican or, or chose to, chose to pass as Mexican as a kind of shorthand for uh, being from uh, Latin America. From there, I graduated. I went to a, a Catholic high school in Los Angeles, Loyola High School, graduated, went to New York University where I did my undergraduate in comparative literature. And then I moved to Mexico City um, where I lived for 11 years. That was a kind of um, through the auspices of a mentor of mine who is the translator of Octavio Paz, uh, put me in contact with the poet, the Nobel, he wasn't the Nobel laureate then, but uh, a very esteemed and, and well-known Mexican poet, Octavio Paz. And I worked for him for many years at his cultural journal. It was a kind of, it was a monthly journal of art and politics. And then I worked for a journal of Mexican art, primarily pre-Columbian, colonial, and contemporary called Artes de Mexico. So I lived in Mexico for about 11 years, also worked as a freelance writer, and then I moved back to the United States and worked as a curator here in Texas, actually, at uh, what is now called Texas State University. It was uh, at, in, San Mar in San Marcos as a photography curator. And then I pursued my PhD at the State University of New York, Buffalo, and since then I've been at different institutions. My first, uh, my first teaching position was at the University of California, San Diego, then at the University of Texas, Austin, then at FMU in Dallas, and I've been at the University of Houston since 2014, teaching wow. in, the creative, in the creative writing program and in the art history department. So I, I've had this sort of dual um, interdisciplinary background and training in both the visual arts and the language arts. That's awesome. So you have like uh you have the Colombian roots, but you also know a lot about the Mexican culture, huh? Yes, and I mean, and because I lived in Mexico for for ten years, eleven years, many people assume that I that my heritage is Mexican, and I mean it's it's I think it's one of these uh, factors today that so many Latinx artists and writers now have very uh, a variety of, of ethnic heritage, right? So there are, I'm thinking of someone like um, Ruben Martinez, who used to teach here at the University of Houston. He's a renowned uh, essayist and journalist. He's now at the university, he's now at the Loyola Marymount University. I believe he's, his mother is El Salvador, from El Salvador, his father is Mexican or vice versa. So you have different nationalities from Latin America, different parents from Peru or mother from Mexico or, um, you know, a kind of, or, or Anglo father and Mexican mother. I mean, a very kind of all these uh, combinations of, of nationalities and ethnicities that now form sort of Latinx identity. That's interesting you say that because uh, Professor Fernandez thought you were Mexican too. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that she she found out you're actually Colombian and yes 
and it's primarily because my research has been in Mexico. So, uh, and right. my, you know, and my books, some of my poetry books take place in Mexico as well. Um, so this, it, you know, I, I have been back to Colombia, but my, most of my family has, has emigrated to the United States, although I have some cousins still in, in Bogota. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing all of that. It was super yeah. cool and interesting. Okay, so let's talk about some of your writing. Um, what genres of writing do you do? So I would say that I work in a variety of uh, formats and genres. I'm primarily a poet, so I write uh, uh, poetry and translate poetry from the Spanish and from the Portuguese. Mm-hmm. I have three published books uh, of, of poetry. One of them is called Mirrors for Gold. The second one is called Full Foreground. The most recent one, uh, excuse me, the second book is called Exposition Park, and the most recent book is um, uh, Full Foreground. And I have a forthcoming book that will appear in about a year or two called Why the Assembly Disbanded. But being a poet, when I moved to Mexico, I, in my 20s, I was interacting with the visual art world very in- intensely. Many of my friends were were working artists, and there was a very sort of intense underground scene of artists, musicians, writers who all sort of uh, interacted during the 90s in, in Mexico City. And in that environment, I was often asked to write critical pieces or essays on the work of my of my pals or the work of other artists. And then I began to publish my art criticism in various newspapers and journals. And so I um, I have an, sort of my, another format would be that I'm an art critic. And then uh, I trained at the University of Buffalo, the State University of New York at Buffalo, in the English department, but I actually was also training as an art historian. So I, my positions at university since then have, have mostly been with art history departments. And I've focused primarily on photography, 20th century, but I've written about other kinds of art as well. And I've written about um, Chicano and, and Latinx contemporary art as well. So I would say uh, poet, art writer, translator, and uh, essayist. Nice. Jack of all trades. <laughs> Do you have a, a particular favorite piece of work that you wrote? Well, I was thinking that, you know, very often writers are most attached to what they've written most recently, although I don't think that that's really the case with me. I mean, I I, I definitely have a certain kind of um, – I'm now working on a fifth book, um, and I have just started a, a sequence of poems. And I'm attached to them, but I don't know exactly where they will lead. And I, I really do think that I'm that I work with a with the book as a thought form. And so I think I'm attached to two books in particular. I think the book that I'm attached to of the poetry books the most is probably the one that may be the 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 most challenging. I think for some, it's the most recent one called full foreground, although in um, in sequence it was actually completed before my second book that appeared uh, published. And it's it's the book that takes place in a sense during my the years I lived in Mexico City that were very turbulent years in terms of the, the kind of social unrest and the political uh, conflicts that were taking place in Mexico mm-hmm. as on the one hand the government at the time, the the administration of the president, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, was implementing what are now called le- neoliberal sort of economics, and that led to a lot of sort of clashing uh, at the social level. And then in 1994, I was in Mexico City when the Zapatistas sort of uh, uh, came into the foreground in, in Chiapas and presented a new kind of challenge to uh, sort of the national identity and, and the, the sort of the whole project of Mexican of Mexican politics and identity. So that book it sounds very it sounds like as if it were social science, but they're just they're poems written from a very uh, a, 
the personal experience of what it, of what it means to be in a place that's undergoing sort of transformation. Um, mm. And they incorporate many voices. So it's they're all in a sense my voice in quotation marks, but they're voices of you know the disenfranchised, of the poor, right. of the of the you know of the subaltern, of the uh, you know there are murderous voices, there are bureaucratic voices. It's all of those are kind of a tumble of of different voices, kind of what would be called in, like in poetry the the choral voices. They're all that are representing that are kind of filtered through myself, but that are okay. that are kind of uh, sort of channeling the voices of of, of a society. Okay. And the other so book, that, I'm, that, go ahead. I was going to say the other book I'm fond of is, is is a book of art history that I wrote about a Chicana veteran. She's from Texas. She's very much very still act, very much active today. Her name is Celia Alvarez Munoz, and she is a an artist from El Paso who really began to come into her own in the 1990s as well. I wrote the book in 2007, eight, and it was published in nine 2009. And her work is very playful, and it's about sort of multilingualism or bilingualism. It's about she's a she's a photography based artist, but she really, one of the other formats she she's interested in is the the photo book or the artist book. And so a lot of it is about the book I wrote is kind of structured in the way that her life prior to being an artist she was a she was a teacher, and in a sense her work is about pedagogy or about sort of these lesson plans about how art can actually um, engage um, different aspects of society, be it the language arts, be it uh, uh, the, the social sciences, be it the, um, uh, the manual arts and the public arts. So in a sense, the book was kind of structured in that way. And I, I love the challenge of a, of a monograph that had very specific constraints it had to be a certain number of pages. It had to have a certain amount of illustrations, and just tackling the idea of, of trying to go against the the idea of a uh, the monograph as a kind of starting from A to B necessarily that that you start from when the artist was born and you end with the most recent work, and kind of creating sort of narrative strategies that were more circular or more literary. And so I'm, I'm, I'm I, in addition to the fact that I think she's one of the great artists contemporary artist that still hasn't received the recognition she deserves. Mm -hmm. So are these kind of, uh, these experiences and, uh, um, I guess, yeah, these kind of, ex what really inspires you to write your poetry particularly? Like, is there anything specific or, or anything like I mean, that? I, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, this is, it's not that I'm not unique insofar as I think most artists and writers are inspired by a kind of dissatisfaction, right? That there's okay. something in the world that's not quite right, or there's, a, there's, there's an experience. You know, I would say that my, that my work is inspired by trying to convey to others the particular kinds of experiences that are those of a poet. And usually they're Experiences that are that are both emotional and involve the affects, but involve the intellect and involve primarily the the like sound qualities. What does it mean to exist in that which we call sort of uh, poetic the poetic word? And so I would say that I'm in, I'm inspired by the idea that I'm inspired by history. I'm inspired by the fact that I knowing that we're there were these these individuals were these subjects living in, in a contemporary world and that were kind of in time but out of time at the same at the same moment. You know, we're both timely and untimely. We're sort of in sync but also belated and trying to convey the experience of, of um, undergoing sensations while at the same time being the observer of those sensations at the same time. That's that's awesome. So in a sense, I mean, I think that my work would not be described as having a kind of um, a recognizable narrative sequence, 
But that's only if we think of narrative as, again, going from A to B to C. Um, right. the, the great French filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard said, you know, every story has a beginning, middle, and an end, but not mm-hmm. necessarily in that, in that order. Okay. Well, I have one last question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. How does your work fit into the category of assimilation and, and also uh, acculturation? So that's, I mean, that's a very deep and a very good question, a very challenging question. And I, and I think that my work has, has been one in which has really been, I mean, in a sense, this is kind of the, the one of the central questions to, to, to my work as a poet. Um, my decision to move to Mexico, in a sense, was a way of recuperating my a kind of relationship to my ancestry, my heritage. Uh, I, I had already, you know, Spanish was spoken in the home from, you know, early on, but it's, it's often the case with Latinx um, uh, children in the United States. The parents may speak in Spanish, and then the, the the children begin to answer in English. And with my siblings, for example, I only speak in English. And so language was very important to me. And the idea of not of of really um, dominating and, and being completely fluent, both speaking and writing in Spanish. And so the the um, the prospect of assimilation, as I understand your question, is, is for example the idea that one becomes, one lets certain aspects of one's folk culture or or of one's ethnicity um, sort of fall into the background as a way of being able to move in the foreground of the United States. But at the same time, even, you know, in my my lifetime, the United States has become even much more uh, diverse. Something, there's an interesting, I just, Reread this again, which is that of the 300 million or so inhabitants of the United States, a third of those, uh, or a third of those, English is a second language, right? So already that tells mm-hmm. us something about how the, the mechanics of acculturation, assimilation can or cannot take place. And I think our culture, and I think we're going through this, a very difficult moment right now because I think we're at this moment in which there, we want to have a kind of an overarching national narrative, but in point mm-hmm. of fact, I think um, uh, collective, collectivities like what we call the nation are ample enough, capacious enough, so that, that no one kind of assimilation needs to take place. And and the question would be then, what would we be assimilating to? Right? There are so right. many different aspects of the dominant. Let's call it the dominant culture what we see on television, what we hear on the radio, that would yeah. make it almost an impossibility to, to, name that, to make it one sort of mono, monolithic thing. What yeah, I do I think we do, right, we do have, what, we're, what we become are kind of open, and I do believe in encounter, that what we're, that for me, culture is about encounter. That, that when something is, when I encounter another set of practices and beliefs and attitudes, which, then it immediately I'm made aware of what I, what I, what I believe and have believed until that moment. And maybe I question then what I have come to believe because I'm being challenged by another set of assumptions, right? Mm-hmm. All these are kind of questions that are, that are of great interest to me. And in a sense, I mean, more recently I've, uh, in the last six years, seven years, I began traveling to Brazil because I wanted to, learn Portuguese, which I did in 2010, kind of in an immersive uh, experience. I kind of did a, a month-long crash course in, in Sao Paulo, and more or less after after a month, I was able to sort of, you know, uh, make myself, you know, communicate and, and make myself be understood. Um, but it's a very humbling, I mean, I think that is one of the, the great kind of metaphors for assimilation and, and acculturation is, is learning another language as an adult, right? Because you're, you're you're humbled, you're forced to speak as a child, because you you don't have the language automatically. So you have to begin to 
to make statements in very simple forms. And you, then you also begin to realize that, you know, you, there's this whole other world that is culturally specific to the language or to the country of countries in which that language is spoken that then begins to open up because you have access through the language, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember I'm a great fan of, of what's called MPB, Musica Brasileira Popular, Brazilian popular music like Caetano Veloso, Milton Nascimento. When I finally, having listened to it for many, many years before I really understood Portuguese, and there's this assumption that, that, that Spanish speakers really understand Portuguese, but that's really not quite true. They're, they are similar on the page, but, but very, very different in terms of how they're pronounced. And it's very, very difficult for us Spanish speakers to learn Portuguese. It's a little bit easier for uh, Portuguese speakers to learn Spanish. It's just a, that's just kind of the nature of the, the, the logic and the, the, the structure of, the, of each language. But when I finally was able to listen to Milton Nascimento and, and I realized I was understanding the lyrics, it was really kind of a, an extraordinary um, an awakening, in a sense, right? That, that I realized I had access to something that I hadn't had before. And in a sense, that's, I mean, assimilation is this idea that one, assimilation is the, is the economy of gain and loss, right? That somehow there's this sense that you have to lose something in order to gain something, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's possible that we can, that we can, that we don't, that, that every, that a gain doesn't necessarily signify a loss. That, if, that I, that assimilation doesn't necessarily mean that I have to sacrifice something for my, for my ethnic, um, lineage, right? Right. Well, sounds like you, uh, you've been around the block. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you sound extremely knowledgeable and, uh, I mean, again, I really, really appreciate your help with the interview, and um, of, of course, um, I I'm will send you. Some, yeah, I'll send you some links to. You know, I have a website that's under construction, so it's. Um, I don't know if I'll, it'll probably be done by January, but I have links to my UH page and maybe to, to a couple of lectures that I've given there, and they're kind of they're they're less academic lectures and more sort of more performance lectures or or poetic lectures that, that might be of interest as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would definitely want to check those out. Excellent. Well, keep me posted, uh, Alex, about your, uh, uh, your, your progress. If you stay in Houston and, uh, just let me know how your, how things are going. Yeah, I'll let you know, um, about everything. I'll let you know, um, how the project went and the interview and all of that. I'll keep you updated for sure. Excellent. But like, like I said, um, I really appreciate the help. It's been, uh, uh, it's been awesome. Uh, of course. Very good to, me to meet you, Alex, and all best on your on your project, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Tejada. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. 
Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye. Take care, Alex. Have a good one. Bye bye. You too.